Hello, this is Chef John from FoodWishes.com with Super Deluxe Steak Nachos. That's right, why would anyone make regular nachos when they could be making Super Deluxe Steak Nachos? I know that is a great question. But anyway, with the Super Bowl right around the corner, I thought I'd show you something that's going to be perfect for your game day buffet. I mean, when you serve something like this, no matter how boring the game is, or how lame the halftime show will be, and it's always lame, except when Cher does it, but when you have something like this on a table, no one will care, okay? So let's go ahead and get started with the steak. So what I have here is about a pound and a half piece of flap steak, also known as flap meat. Don't worry, it only sounds inappropriate. And what we want to do is season this on both sides with salt, freshly ground black pepper, and some chipotle. And while this flap steak is my personal favorite choice, something that works just as well and is incredibly similar would be skirt steak, which we have tons of recipes for. So you should be able to get either of those cuts at any butcher, but generally skirt steak's a little easier to find, so that will work. And why we want to do our steak first is because we're going to need to cook this and let it cool completely before we dice it to use on the nachos. So once we have our meat seasoned, we'll head over to the stove, where we're going to cook this in a little bit of vegetable oil over a medium-high heat for about, I don't know, maybe six minutes per side until we have about a medium. And I realize we usually shoot for medium rare or less, but with this particular cut of meat in this particular dish, I think we're going to get a better taste and texture if we go a little further. And I'll touch on this issue in the blog post. But one thing I will mention, when you see them prep this kind of meat at the taqueria, it's actually cut in much thinner slices, and they grill it till it's pretty much cooked through. And yet it's still always incredibly delicious. And by the way, one quick tip here. Please use a thermometer to check the internal temp. I think we want to shoot for about 135-ish. And that's because I find this meat has a very soft feel. So if you're trying to tell by poking it, you can get fooled. But anyway, one way or another, we're going to cook our meat to about medium, at which point we'll remove that to a bowl to rest. And as soon as we do, we're going to turn off the heat and add a splash of water to our pan to deglaze all that amazing goodness off the bottom. Which, as any self-respecting food wisher knows, is called a fond. So I'm going to switch to a wooden spatula to make sure all that comes off the bottom nicely. And then what we'll do is we'll pour that goodness over our meat and let it cool completely before we cut it. All right, I cannot stress this enough. Do not cut that meat hot or warm. It should be room temp or cold, like mine is here. I actually cooked mine in the morning and popped it in the fridge till the afternoon. And then once our meat has been properly cooled, we can go ahead and slice it. So what I like to do is make nice thick slices with the grain, which for a cut like this and skirt steak is very easy to find. And then we'll cut those pieces into two or three thinner strips. And then we'll simply turn that and slice this against the grain into a nice small dice. And because we let our meat cool properly, not only is it easier to cut, but we're not going to lose any of those amazingly flavorful juices. So we'll go ahead and cut up our beef and add it right back into the same bowl it came from. And we'll take a spoon and we'll toss it with all those beautiful pan drippings we recovered by deglazing. And that's it. Our steak has officially been prepped. And at this point, we could use that as is, or we can just wrap that up and pop it in the fridge until needed. And then besides prepping our steak, the other thing we need to do is get together our refried beans, which is going to start with one of two recommended fats which would be lard, which I'm using here, or some rendered bacon fat. So I'm going to melt a couple tablespoons of fat over medium heat, and then into that we will toss a finely diced onion with the traditional pinch of salt, and cook those stirring for about five or six minutes until they start to soften and sweeten and turn translucent. You know the drill. And once our onions are just about to that point, I like to add a pinch of dry oregano. And by the way, if you have access to espizote, that would be even a better choice. But anyway, I'm going to toss in a little bit of dry oregano, and we'll cook that for a few seconds before adding our drained and rinsed canned pinto beans. And this would be the perfect time to admit we're not making real refried beans here. This is just a quick but still delicious shortcut version, especially made for nachos. So save your cards and letters. I'm sure we'll do the proper version one day. But anyway, we're going to dump in our beans in a splash of water, and we'll stir that together and let it come back to a simmer. And I'd like to let it cook about five minutes or so, and our beans are already cooked, but I like to do that to make sure the onions are nice and soft and sweet. And at that point, we're going to turn our heat down to low and smash these with a potato masher or something similar. And how smooth and creamy you make these is totally up to you. You guys are the gauchos of your nachos, so you're going to have to cowboy up and make the tough call for how much to smash these. Actually, I'm just kidding. It's not a tough call because these are good chunky, smooth, or somewhere in between, which is kind of how I'm doing them. And then once those are mashed to our liking, we will add more liquid to get the appropriate texture. Because keep in mind, these do have to be loose enough to spoon over nachos. So we'll stir in some water until we have something that looks sort of like this. 
Oh, and by the way, if you make these ahead, they're going to really tighten up. So don't be surprised if you have to add a little more liquid when you heat these up. But anyway, once we're happy with our viscosity, we need to season these up with some salt. And quite possibly more than you think. Because what will happen is you'll add a spoon, and you'll stir it in, and you'll taste it, and you will be shocked how bland these are. So you'll add more salt, and then it will be better. And not that these need to be exactly bursting with flavor. The beans are kind of a semi-bland glue for the nachos, and they're going to go with lots of other flavorful ingredients. But we do want them properly seasoned with salt. And then once our beans are set, we can finally build our super deluxe nachos. So let's go ahead and toss some corn tortilla chips into a heat-proof pan. And personally, I think two to three chips deep is perfect. And once our pan has been chipped, we'll go ahead and top that with some beans. And how much to use, we're going to leave up to you, as we will with all the elements in this. I'm not going to give you specific exact amounts for nachos, that's crazy. So we're going to spoon over what we would consider enough. And then once we have placed down what we consider the perfect amount of refried beans, we will go ahead and top with a generous handful of our steak. And of course, if you're vegetarian, you're going to skip this step. And instead, I recommend maybe using some tofurkey or possibly vegan chorizo. Actually, I'm kidding. Don't use either of those. But anyway, we will scatter over our beautiful diced steak, followed by, of course, some grated cheese. And the classic blend would be 50% sharp cheddar and 50% Monterey Jack. Although if you press me, I probably do prefer all cheddar, but I thought I would go classic here. And then once we finish sprinkling over this cheese, we have two options to cook this. We can toss this into a hot oven, about 450 for 10 minutes or so, until the cheese is melted and the edges of our chips start to brown. Or if our beans are still hot and our steak's not too cold, we could have just done this under the broiler for a few minutes. It really doesn't matter as long as your cheese melts and everything gets heated through. And at this point, because we added beans and meat, we've gone from nachos to super nachos, but now we need to go from super nachos to super deluxe nachos, which means adding all the following fixings. So first up for me, I'm gonna scatter over some nice, beautiful ripe avocado that I diced and tossed with a little bit of lemon juice and salt. And as usual, all these finer details will be expanded upon on the blog post. So I'm gonna scatter over some diced avocado, followed by some very finely diced onions. And I'm using white onions, because for whatever reason, those seem to be the ones they always use at the taqueria. They must know something. And then after the onion, we're gonna do some diced tomato. And I know I've told you to never serve tomato in the winter, but unless you invited Alice Waters to your party, nobody's gonna care. And then to complete what is basically a deconstructed salsa cruda, I'm gonna do some finely diced jalapeno pepper. And speaking of salsa, if you wanna use that instead, go ahead. I just think for me that's a little too wet, and I prefer to use all those same ingredients in this diced form. And then let's finish this thing off with some sour cream. You can dollop, but I much prefer to squeeze. I just think it's much more visually arresting. And then last but not least, a whole bunch of freshly chopped cilantro, and our super deluxe steak nachos are done. I mean, close your eyes and imagine that is the centerpiece of your snack table. Actually, you know what? Open your eyes and look at it while you imagine that. That right there is going to impress your guests. And that's just the looks. What do you tear into this? Which I'm going to do right now. And of course, like all platters and nachos, you're going to have your two distinct layers. Your top layer, where your chips are loaded with a little bit of everything. And the bottom layer containing the clean chips, with which we use to scoop up all the stuff that fell off the top layer. Which hasn't happened yet. But trust me, it will. And of course, it goes without saying that if you're not into group nacho, you can easily do these as individual portions. As long as your plates are heat proof, you can toss those under the broiler for a couple minutes and enjoy the exact same thing in just a little smaller format. But either way, it doesn't really matter. You're still going to be enjoying one of the most delicious party foods ever invented. Just an amazing amalgamation of tastes and textures. And I really do hope you give these a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Jerk chicken wings. That's right, as you know, every year we try to do a new and exciting chicken wing recipe before the Super Bowl. And this year we're inspired by Jamaica's famous and incredibly delicious grilled chicken recipe, which is kind of funny because they don't play football in Jamaica. The big sport there is of course bobsledding. And while I do love this on grilled half chickens, it is beyond fantastic used as a hot wing recipe. So let's get started. I mean, these chicken wings aren't gonna be Jamaican themselves. And of course, the first thing we're gonna need is chicken wings. And there's mine, I have three pounds. And as you'll notice, there's no flats. This is made up entirely of the drumette part of the wing. And I usually don't buy this kind, I actually like the flat part of the wing. But these were on sale and will work beautifully. So I have three pounds of these. 
We're going to go ahead and put those in a large mixing bowl because we're going to marinate these, which is the next step. So in a blender, we're going to start with some chopped onion, some whole peeled garlic cloves, and a handful of chopped green onions. And then to that, we're going to add what I consider two of the most key ingredients, some habanero peppers. Oh, they're hot. And some fresh thyme. And for the thyme, we're simply going to pick those leaves off. That's easy. And then for the habanero peppers, all we're going to do is chop those up roughly. But before we do, we're going to want to remove the seed pod, which is not hard. Just cut them in half. And if you cut out that little top part where the stem comes into the pepper, that's where most of the seeds are going to be located. And above and beyond removing the stem and seeds, you also probably want to remove most of those white membranes. That is where a lot of the heat resides. And these peppers are super hot to begin with, so I'm going to trim that out, although I will spare you watching that. All right, so we're going to trim those up, chop them up roughly, and throw those into the blender. And like I said, we're going to pick all the leaves off the thyme and add a good amount of that. You're going to want a couple tablespoons, very critical ingredient. And then after adding the vegetation, we're going to go ahead and spice this up. And for that, we're going to use a whole bunch of salt, some freshly ground black pepper. Ooh, check it out, pepper sinkhole. After the black pepper, we're going to add a whole bunch of allspice. Another signature flavor in this, do not skip or skimp on the allspice. We're also going to want some dry thyme, which is not easy to see because I switched camera angles because I was getting bored of the overhead view. We're also going to add some cinnamon and a little bit of cumin. And then last but not least for the spices, a whole bunch of freshly grated nutmeg. Oh, you got to freshly grate it. Everybody's doing it. So a healthy dose of nutmeg, and that's pretty much it for the spices, and it's on to the wet ingredients. So let's go ahead and add a splash of vegetable oil, along with a nice big drizzle of soy sauce. And then to balance out all these strong flavors, we're going to need a little bit of brown sugar. And thanks to angry emails from psychotic pastry chefs, we are categorizing the brown sugar as a wet ingredient. And then after the sweet, we need the sour. In this case, we're going to use a lime juice and a lot of it. And we'll squeeze that in, and that's pretty much it. So we're going to go ahead and take that over and blend that completely smooth. And you know how we do. Pulse on and off to start. And then we'll just go ahead and leave it on until it's completely smooth. And don't be in a big hurry. We want complete and utter liquefaction, which is what we have right here. And at that point, we're going to go ahead and pour that over our chicken wings. And of course, give them a thorough mixing. All right, chicken wings are famous for their nooks and crannies. And we want to make sure every speck of surface area is covered with that marinade. So be very thorough. And when you're confident that's happened, we're going to go ahead and wrap that in plastic and marinate this overnight. Now that is what I'm officially recommending, but you can get away with as little as a two-hour marinade. And I will let you know how that works on the blog. But anyway, we're going to pop that in the fridge for at least eight hours. And then the next day, we are ready to pan up and roast. And to do that, I'm going to recommend you wrap a baking sheet in heavy-duty foil. And I'm going to give mine a little spritz with the canola oil. If you're using that nonstick foil, you probably don't need to do this. And then we're simply going to transfer the chicken wings from the marinade onto the sheet tray. And you can let a little of the excess marinade drip off, but you want these pretty wet. So we're going to place those on the tray. We're going to distribute them as evenly as possible. At that point, we're going to pop those in a preheated, very hot, 450 degree oven for 25 minutes. And by the way, do not throw away any of that extra marinade. We're going to go ahead and use the rest of that during this glazing process. So don't throw that away. And after 25 minutes, we're going to pull those wings out, and they should look something like this. And then what we're going to do here is paint and turn. So take about half of whatever marinade you have left over, brush it onto the tops of those wings, and when you've brushed a little bit on each one, you're going to go ahead and turn them over. And once we've completed that and they're all flipped over, we're going to go ahead and pop that back in for another 15 minutes. We'll pull them back out, and we'll repeat that process, only this time we're going to turn and then paint. And you can see we're starting to get a little bit of caramelization. All right, so the first time we painted and then turned, this time we're going to turn and then paint. So we'll flip those all over. We'll paint those with the remainder of our marinade. And then those are going to go back in for another 10 or 15 minutes until they're perfect. And you'll know they're perfect when they're all beautifully browned and caramelized. And don't stop until they look like this. What happens is people see that excess marinade getting black around the edges and they stop. They chicken out like a bunch of jerks and they pull it out because they're afraid it's going to burn. But it won't. That's just the edges. So don't let those dark bits scare you. You have to cook these wings until they're well browned. And then one last tip. Let them sit on the foil for five minutes before trying to remove them. As they cool a little bit, they'll contract and they'll come off that foil a lot easier. And at that point, you are free to transfer these into some kind of serving platter. I went ahead and cliched mine up with some crunchy plantain chips. And then in case anyone wanted a little additional acidity, I also put some small lime wedges. And I serve these as is. I don't think you need a dipping sauce, but that's up to you. You are, after all, the Peter Tosh of your nosh. And then, of course, it's time for the official taste. As you'll notice, I'm grabbing the largest, most beautiful trophy wing. 
and that was just so unbelievably flavorful and delicious. It just has an incredible balance between the salty, the spicy, the sweet, the sour. Just absolutely addictive. If you were looking for a new and relatively exciting hot wing recipe for your Super Bowl party, these really were truly amazing. And I really hope you give these a try. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Honey Sriracha Chicken Wings. That's right, not only are you gonna see a super delicious, an unbelievably easy chicken wing glaze. But besides that, I'm also gonna show you the ultimate method for doing chicken wings in the oven that come out just as crispy as the deep fried ones. And yes, we've done many other oven fried chicken wing recipes, but this one quite frankly blows them all away. And the coolest thing is we're gonna do it with an ingredient you would never think in a million years would go on a chicken wing. Okay, so let's get started. And of course, none of this is gonna be possible without some chicken wings. So I have about two and a half pounds here of fresh chicken wing sections. You got your flats and you got your drums. And you can usually find these already cut up like this. But if you do buy the whole ones, we've posted videos to show you how to break those down. So I'll put a link to that somewhere. And once we're all set with our wings, we can move on to the spice rub, which is gonna start off pretty routinely with some kosher salt. We're also gonna add some freshly ground black pepper, and then we'll add a little bit of smoked paprika. So, so far, nothing too out of the ordinary. But then, to this, we're gonna add two spoons of baking powder. No, I haven't been drinking. We're gonna add in two big spoons of baking powder, not baking soda, baking powder, and we'll give that a mix. And believe it or not, that baking powder is gonna cause a chemical reaction on the surface of those wings that's gonna very, very closely mimic what happens when you deep fry them. So once that's mixed up, we're gonna sprinkle over about half and we'll give that a little toss to coat. Then we will dump over the other half of the mixture, give it another toss. Okay, we want all these chicken wings perfectly and evenly coated with that mixture. And once our wings have been tossed in our spice mixture, we'll go ahead and transfer those onto a sheet pan. And what I like to do here is put down a piece of foil and then place a baking rack right on top. And then I'll transfer the wings on top of that rack. And this will still work if you don't have one of those. But by raising those wings up a little bit, we're gonna get heat convection underneath, which really does help the crisping process. And of course, you're gonna place these down thoughtfully. We don't want them on top of each other, we want them evenly spaced. And once those have been panned up, we'll go ahead and transfer those into the center of a 425 degree oven for 20 minutes, at which point we'll pull them out and give them a turn. And do not expect these to look good at this point. In fact, they look the opposite of good. They look strange and scary. Because of that baking powder, the skin's gonna take on a very dry, kind of white powdery appearance that once saturated with the natural chicken fats in the skin is gonna turn unbelievably crispy. So we're gonna give those a turn and we're gonna put them back in for another 20 minutes. At which point we'll pull them out and repeat the process. And now you can see most of that dry surface has disappeared. You may still see a little dry spot here and there, no big deal. Those areas should get saturated with the fat as these cook. But if you're nervous, you can always dab some available chicken fat on those spots. So like I said, we'll flip those over. And then what we'll do is we'll pop those back in for another 10, 15 minutes or so until they're brown and crispy. It's gonna depend on the size of your wings and other variables. So we'll go ahead and pop those back in to finish cooking. And while we're waiting, let's go ahead and mix up our honey sriracha glaze, which as I mentioned, is incredibly easy. In fact, this is so simple, it's almost not a recipe. So let's add some honey to a bowl. And then to our honey, we're basically gonna add the same amount of si ra cha, which is how I've been told to pronounce it. Three distinct syllables, si ra cha. Although you know what, that sounds kind of weird. I'm going back to sriracha. And then besides the two main ingredients, we're also gonna put in a little drizzle of rice vinegar and a few drops of sesame oil, just a few. And we'll give that a mix, and that's pretty much it. So our glaze is set. At this point, we'll head back to the oven to grab our wings, which are hopefully cooked by now. So let's check it out. And oh yeah, those are done. And you'll know because the meat will be tender and those wings will be beautifully browned and crispy. Like crispy for real. Check it out, fork don't lie. And by the way, if you're thinking, great, they're crispy, but it tastes like baking powder now. It does not at all. You would never know it was ever on there. And of course I could explain scientifically how all this works, you know, after learning it myself, but why bother? Who says we have to understand everything? All I know is that it produces an incredibly crispy wing with absolutely no off flavor. So just an incredibly cool and super effective technique. And of course, for our last step, we're gonna to toss those in a bowl. We will drizzle over our glaze and we'll flip those around to coat. Sure, you can use a spatula or a spoon for this part, but I really prefer the old buffalo bowl flip. 
But that's up to you. You are the boss of your sauce toss. And by the way, look how gorgeous that sauce is. That color is so beautiful, it looks artificial, which is like the ultimate compliment. And then once our formerly crispy wings are coated in that glaze, we'll transfer that to a serving platter. And because we used some sesame oil earlier, it's completely legal and appropriate to sprinkle a few sesame seeds on top. And sure, that's a garnish, but mostly it's to identify these are not, not your average buffalo chicken wing. Oh, far from it. So let me go in for the official taste, and we'll forget about texture for a minute. This glaze is so good. I think it just has that perfect balance between sweet and heat. And then above and beyond that magnificent taste, the texture really is almost identical to what you get out of a deep fryer. And by the way, if you're wondering, why does it matter if the wings are crisp? If you're going to toss them in a wet sauce anyway? That's a great question. But the reason the deep fried buffalo wings are so much better is because the surface grabs on and holds the sauce. All right, it's almost as if the skin kind of fuses to the meat and really soaks in the sauce into all those little micro blisters. Whereas a baked wing has a much smoother, much more slippery, kind of flabby surface. And it just doesn't hold on to the sauce as well, okay? But anyway, that's it. Honey Sriracha Chicken Wings. Every year about this time, I get tons of email asking, Chef John, of all your oven cooked chicken wing methods, what would you say is the best? And I never knew how to answer that because they all were about the same. Now I know how to answer that. This is the best. So I really do hope you give it a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Buffalo chicken wing sauce. I cannot believe I haven't shown you this yet. I know we've done wings before, but we've never done the original buffalo style. And like us folks from Western New York, it is a very simple thing. Okay, so the two main ingredients are butter. Although according to my sources in Buffalo, the original recipe called for margarine. Don't use it. So we have butter. We have Frank's hot sauce. You can use Louisiana hot sauce, but Frank's hot sauce is the original. A few drips of Tabasco or other hot sauce. Worcestershire sauce. Of course, some cayenne pepper. Garlic powder. A pinch of salt. And the secret ingredient, white distilled vinegar. Of course, all the ingredients will be on the site. You know they will. All right, we're going to put that over medium heat, and we're going to bring that up to a simmer, stirring with a whisk, and that butter is going to emulsify right into that hot sauce and into the acid from the vinegar. And as soon as you see a few bubbles starting to simmer on the sides, turn it off. Give it a whisk, set it aside, and reserve it. Now, you've seen me make chicken wings before, so I didn't show that. That'll be on the site. So I have my oven fried chicken wings. You can deep fry them if you want. All right, not really necessary. You're going to put them in a stainless steel bowl, pour over some of the sauce. Now this much sauce will make enough for four to five pounds of chicken wings. So I had like two and three quarters pounds here. So I used about a half. Pour the sauce over, put a plate or pan on top and give it a shake. That's how they do it in Buffalo. They don't stir, they shake. Once it's coated, you can serve as is. Or if you want to dry them out a little bit, Throw them back on the sheet pan, drain the oil off, put it back in the oven, which is still a little hot, and let them sit there for about 10 minutes, and the sauce kind of dries onto them a little bit. Either way, delicious. Frank's hot sauce is not very spicy, so if you want this to be extra spicy, make sure you kick it up with some uh, hot sauce or some cayenne and so forth. Anyway, just a little quick and easy video on how to make buffalo-style chicken wing sauce. By the way, this is very close to the original recipe. I went to college with the cousin of a busboy that worked at the original Anchor Bar in Buffalo who said this is what was in it, pretty much. So I hope you give this a try. All the ingredients are on the site. And as always, enjoy. Classic guacamole. That's right, I'm going to be showing you how to make classic, traditional, totally authentic guacamole. Or at least my version. And I'm not sure exactly when you're going to watch this video, but today is National Guacamole Day. So I figured the timing was right. And I know it's not a real holiday, but neither is Valentine's Day. So we're not going to let that stop us. But anyway, let's go ahead and get started. And when you're making guacamole, there's basically two components. There's the avocados and there's everything else. And we're going to be starting with the everything else. So first up, we're going to slice some serrano peppers, which sort of look like small jalapeno, although they are significantly hotter. And yes, we are going to use the seeds and everything. Don't be scared, it's going to be fine. So we will slice those kind of thin all the way down to the stem, and I'm going to do three of those. And then once that's set, I'm going to take a nice big pinch of cilantro and give that a little bit of a chop. And by the way, please stop shaming your friends that don't like cilantro. It's not their fault, it's genetics. All right, for 10% of the public, cilantro actually tastes sort of like soap. 
So don't force them to eat it. Don't make fun of them. Just be happy you're not one of them. But anyway, we're going to give that cilantro a little chop and then pile it up on top of our peppers. And then we're also going to take about a third of a cup of diced white onions and add those to the pile. And then we'll take our knife and give that a brief chopping. And what we're basically doing here is sort of mimicking if we prep these ingredients in a mocajete, which is sort of a large stone mortar in which guacamole is traditionally made. So to simulate that grinding process, what we're going to do is give this a quick chop, and then we'll sprinkle over some kosher salt or some other type of coarse salt. And then we're going to proceed with what I call the old smear and chop. So using the flat of our knife, we're going to kind of smear that against the cutting board, which again, we're trying to sort of simulate the grinding action in that mocajete. And it's that coarseness of the salt that kind of helps the grinding process. And by grinding these ingredients, we're releasing much more flavor than if we just chop this stuff up and toss it in with our avocados. So this step takes a couple minutes, but it's totally worth it. So what we'll do is alternate between smearing and chopping until we've reached as fine a texture as we want. So some people are gonna leave this fairly coarse, while others will prefer to grind this down to a fine paste. But anyway, that's up to you. You are the Jeff Spicoli of your guacamole. But I don't go that far. I like to go until it's right about here. And then what we'll do once that's done is simply set that aside and move on to prepping the avocados, which you probably know how to do, but I'm gonna show you anyway. But before we get to that, make sure you're buying perfect avocados. All right, we don't want them soft or hard. We want them firm but yielding. And really what it should feel like when you press is sort of like modeling clay. That for me is the best description. And then what we'll do to prep these is go ahead and take off that little stem thing. I'll assume that's not the official name. And we'll take our knife and slice in right there until we feel the knife hit that seed. And then we'll simply continue cutting around. And usually we don't cut towards ourselves, But since that seed is stopping the knife, there's very little danger. And then once that's been cut all the way around, we'll simply twist the halves. And voila, we have separation. But we're not done, we have to remove the seed. And to do that, we will carefully but firmly tap that blade on the seed, embedding it about a sixteenth of an inch deep, and then all we have to do is give it a twist, and that seed will come right out. And please do not make the rookie mistake of trying to pull the seed off the knife. That is how you're going to cut yourself. The safe way is put your fingers on the other side and just push it off. See that? So easy. So safe. And sure, if you see any weird brown things, you can go ahead and scrape those out. I think that was a seed sprouting, but I'm not sure. But anyway, once that's halved and pitted, all we have left to do is take a spoon and scoop out that beautiful green flesh into a bowl. And I should mention, unless you're the world's slowest avocado scooper, you don't have to toss this stuff in lime juice. It's not going to turn brown in like 5 or 10 minutes. So some people like to squeeze in lemon or lime as they go. I see no need. So we'll go ahead and halve, pit, and scoop our avocado. And I usually do four large Haas avocados, but these were a little small, so I did six. And once that's set, we can move into final production. So to our avocados, we're going to go ahead and add some more freshly chopped cilantro, as well as our beautifully ground onion and serrano mixture. And then we're definitely going to need to add another generous sprinkling of salt. Avocados are very bland unless you add salt. And then last but not least, we'll squeeze in some fresh lime juice. Or if you're super weird, some lemon juice. And that's it. We'll go ahead and take a potato masher and mash this until it reaches our desired texture. Oh, and I should mention, a lot of people do like to throw in a handful of diced tomato into this, which I like, but my wife Michelle is not a big fan, so I guess I don't like them after all. But anyway, we're going to take our masher and mash this until it's as smooth or as chunky as we want. Personally, I don't like mine too smooth. I definitely want to keep a relatively chunky texture, so I'm going to stop right about here, which for me is perfect. And then once we've determined that's been mashed to perfection, we are pretty much ready to serve, but you have to taste this. It almost always needs another pinch of salt and quite possibly a little more acidity. Oh, and if you're wondering about cayenne, no. Classic guacamole does not have any cayenne in it. So please do not, when no one's looking, sneak in a couple shakes of cayenne. So anyway, we're going to taste and adjust those seasonings. And once that's mixed up, you can go ahead and chill that in the fridge or transfer it into a nicer bowl and serve it up. And I guess garnish should top a little chopped cilantro, which is completely unnecessary but I saw a little bit on the cutting board, so I tossed it down. And of course, make sure you have some chips around. And check it out, I poured a whole bag of chips into that basket, and not one single visible broken chip. Unbelievable. But anyway, that's it. Our classic, traditional, completely authentic guacamole is ready to enjoy. So let me grab a chip and go in and see how I did. And this stuff really is magnificent, which has very little to do with us. It's really the magic of the avocado. Okay, properly seasoned, there are a few things as uniquely delicious. And not to mention one of the world's healthiest foods. 
Avocado is one of the original superfoods and so healthy for you, it will completely counteract the negative effects of the chips and the six pack of beer I'm gonna drink with this. And while I've never had that theory verified by a medical professional, it sounds right. And apparently in this day and age, that's really all that counts. So anyway, that's it, guacamole. Like I said, we're doing this to honor National Guacamole Day. And what better way to celebrate a fake holiday than with a real great dip? So I really do hope you give this a try soon. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Queso dip. That's right, I'm gonna show you how to make a cheese dip that's better looking, better for you, and way, way better tasting than anything you're gonna get at the store. And of course, whether that amount of extra effort's gonna be worth it is gonna be up to you. And will depend on factors like how much you plan on drinking. But if you do decide to make your queso dip from scratch, you'll wanna use this very easy and virtually foolproof technique. And to get started, what we'll do is grate about a half pound of cheese. And I usually don't film this, but it's come to my attention that some of you are still using pre-grated cheese, which I think is a terrible idea since it's usually of lesser quality and coated with cellulose dust. So do me and your guests a favor and take the extra minute or less it takes to grate this yourself. Oh, and in case you're wondering, I'm using a nice sharp white cheddar here, but any melty cheese will work. And sometimes I'll go with half Monterey Jack and half cheddar since that's how they did it in the Mexican restaurant I worked at in college. So feel free to use whatever you want. I mean, you are after all the Jesus of your quesos. Which, by the way, is a much better rhyme in English. But anyway, no matter what cheese we use, once it's grated, we're going to toss it with one tablespoon of cornstarch. All right, just sprinkle it over and take a spoon and give it a toss. And then as soon as our cheese has been successfully starched, we will set that aside and we can move on to preparing the base of our dip. And for that, we're going to melt about a tablespoon of butter over medium-high heat, to which we will add some finely minced or crushed garlic as well as some sliced green onions. And I'm just using the white and lighter parts here, but we will save some of the dark green parts to garnish the top later if we want. And then to our garlic and onions, we will also add a nice big pinch of salt, as well as a little bit of ground chipotle, which as you probably know is a smoked jalapeno. And we'll finish up with a little bit of cumin. And then what we'll do is cook this stirring on medium high for just two minutes. Okay, we're not trying to brown or caramelize anything here. All we're doing is taking off the raw edge. So like I said, we will only give that a couple minutes before adding the next two ingredients, which would be a half cup of canned fire roasted chilies. And I'm actually using hatch chilies here, but any of your popular fire roasted canned peppers will work. As would of course freshly fire roasted chilies. Oh yeah, you get extra credit for that. And then we'll also toss in some diced seeded tomatoes. And we'll go ahead and give that a stir and cook this for like two minutes. And by the way, as you might know, I'm not a huge fan of using fresh tomatoes in the middle of winter, but I'm happy to report this is one of the few recipes where terrible supermarket tomatoes actually work pretty well. So this time at least we can include those without any shame. And then what we'll do after we've cooked our tomatoes and peppers for a couple minutes is add one can of evaporated milk, which depending on the brand you use will come in lots of different colors, none of which will be white. All right, they can range from a pale yellow to a light brown, but don't be concerned. Okay, that color happens because of the way the milk is condensed. Which reminds me, please do not accidentally use sweetened condensed milk. That will not be good. And what we'll do after stirring that in is wait for it to come up to a boil. Because once it does, what we'll do is give it a stir and then carefully and confidently add our cheese. And we will stir that in. And the combination of our melting cheese plus that cornstarch swelling up in this hot liquid is going to thicken this mixture up. And then, very important, as soon as our cheese is melted, we want to immediately turn off the heat. All right, we never want to boil a cheese sauce because it will get all grainy and separated and not have a good texture. So as soon as that cheese melts, turn off your heat. And then we'll finish this up by stirring in a nice handful of chopped cilantro, if you're going to use it. Okay, if you don't like it, don't put it. It's not going to bother me at all. But I do like it, so I'm going to stir some in. And that's it. At this point, our queso dip is pretty much done. Except, of course, we have to taste it for seasoning, which we are not going to do off a spoon or our finger. All right, we need to use a chip, which have salt on them. And by tasting this on a chip, we will get a much more accurate gauge for whether we have to adjust the seasoning. And I decided mine needed a little more salt and a little more heat. So I gave it a few shakes of cayenne. 
and gave it one final stir. And that's it. Once that's tasting exactly how we want, we'll go ahead and serve it up. Next to probably a whole bunch of corn chips. And I hope you like how those look, because those took me about 30 minutes to arrange. But anyway, we will serve that up and maybe top it with some more diced tomato. And possibly a little scattering of green onion. Plus one last gratuitous shake of cayenne. And that's it, our queso is now ready for our feso. So let me go ahead and dip in. And that, my friends, as you can imagine, was absolutely delicious. And as I mentioned earlier, sure this takes a little more work. But the taste and texture of this is so far superior than anything out of a jar. It is not even close to the same experience. Oh, and speaking of texture, as this stuff cools down, it will thicken up. But only to a certain point. Alright, one of the things I love about this recipe is even when it's fully cooled, it still retains a beautiful, creamy, smooth texture. And above and beyond avoiding like a dozen ingredients we can't spell or pronounce, the beauty of making this from scratch is that you can easily tailor this to your own personal taste. Okay, we already said you could add different cheeses, but you could also add things like pickled vegetables, or maybe some roasted corn, or yes, even a handful of nice crispy bacon. But anyway, that's it. How I like to make queso cheese dip, which if you don't speak Spanish, translates to cheese cheese dip. But anyway, whether you're gonna serve this for the big game or just any old time you're craving a delicious cheesy snack, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Buffalo chicken dip. That's right, all the flavor, none of the bones, all of the taste, none of the groans. And yet still an incredibly delicious snack for your game day buffet. So let me show you how to put this classic baked dip together. And we're gonna start with chicken. Now most of these buffalo chicken dip recipes call for canned chicken, which is really not what I want you to use. At the very least, go out and get yourself a rotisserie chicken. Just about every big supermarket in the world sells these. And one small rotisserie chicken will give you just exactly the amount of chicken you need for this recipe and yes you could roast your own chicken of course but you know what you're really busy getting ready for a big party it's okay you can buy a rotisserie chicken but anyway we need some cooked chicken i'm gonna remove the skin and the bones what about cartilage yes tendons of course remove those too all right so once i have just the meat i'm gonna take a cleaver and i'm gonna cut it into kind of a small dice now you can go really fine here almost like a paste but i do like some decent sized pieces of chicken so i'm gonna cut mine just like that I'm going to throw that in a bowl with a couple packages of full fat cream cheese, the real stuff. All right, please don't use the diet cream cheese for this. We only eat this once a year. Do you think we could just get it with the real ingredients, please? Thank you. All right, next we need our hot sauce. And of course, we're using the authentic Frank's Red Hot hot sauce. That's the original buffalo style chicken wing hot sauce. So we're going to pour that in. Blue cheese dressing and crumbled blue cheese. All right, after our blue cheese... I'm going to throw in the closest thing I have to a secret ingredient, some Old Bay, all right? And also some cayenne because Frank's hot sauce is really not that hot. And I definitely want this to have a lot of heat, so I sell more beer. I mean, so my guests drink more beer. And I'm also going to throw in a little bit of pepper jack cheese. And we'll also save a little bit of that for the top. All right, get in there with your spatula or your wooden spoon and mix it until thoroughly combined. By the way, buffalo chicken wings go with blue cheese dressing, not ranch. I don't know who decided to start serving ranch dressing with chicken wings. Probably some idiot. But it really doesn't go as well as blue cheese. You want that salty, sharp tang. Okay, once all that is mixed perfectly together, I'm going to transfer that into some kind of baking dish. You don't need to oil it. You don't need to grease it. I'm using just a deep-sided pie dish. But this will work in any kind of standard casserole dish. All right, so anything that's heat-proof. I'm going to go ahead and smooth out the top. And then before we pop it in the oven, we're going to go ahead and put on just a little more cheese. All right. So that's going to go in a preheated 400 degree oven for about 15, 20 minutes until heated through. Now, one little trick I like to do towards the end here, I'll go ahead and flip on the top broiler for like two minutes just to brown the top a little bit. All right. That's optional, but I like to do it. And there you go. Our hot, ready to serve baked buffalo chicken dip. I'm going to garnish with a little bit of cayenne just to sort of give people the visual warning that, yes, you are about to eat something that's hot. Be careful. All right, you probably want to let that cool a couple minutes before you put it out, but this is fine hot. This is fine warm. This is good room temperature. This is even good cold. 
And of course, I'm going to serve this up with some crackers and celery sticks. The celery, in case we have any vegans or vegetarians, I don't believe they're allowed to eat crackers. Okay, but I'm not sure. But just in case, we're going to have some celery sticks. And that is ready to taste. All right, it's going to be very runny and loose when it's hot. It definitely tightens up significantly as it cools. All right, let me get into some of this. It is so good. It tastes like creamy, boneless buffalo chicken wings. What's not awesome about that? All right, Super Bowl parties are coming up. You're supposed to show up with a dish to pass. And what do you usually show up with? A bag of potato chips. And what do your friends say behind your back? Dude, so lame. All right, so this year it's going to be different. You're going to show up with this. Super simple, inexpensive to make. Everybody loves it. Come on, this is a winner. Like those great philosophers 69 boys once said, if you ain't dipping, you must be tripping. And that is so true. So anyway, I really hope you give that a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts, as usual. And as always, enjoy. Mini Buffalo Chicken Egg Rolls. That's right, finally a recipe for people that can't decide whether to make egg rolls or buffalo style chicken wings. Because with this new easy to make appetizer breakthrough, we can kind of have both at the same time. And since we are right in the middle of peak snack season, the timing to share this I think is perfect. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. And first up, we need to cut up some cooked chicken. And what I have here is some leftover poached chicken breasts I did to make a chicken salad. And what we want to do here is cut this up somewhere between a dice and a cube. And that size doesn't really have a name, but sometimes I'll refer to it as dice cubes. But anyway, we'll go ahead and slice that across one way and then turn it and slice it across the other. And I'm not going to show it all, but I went ahead and did that to about 8 ounces of chicken total, which is roughly about a cup and a half. And we'll go ahead and add that to a mixing bowl, along with all of our favorite buffalo chicken wing ingredients, including some diced celery, as well as a couple ounces of blue cheese. And please, buy yourself a little wedge of the real stuff. All right, we don't want to be using that dry, pre-crumbled stuff in the plastic container. And then we'll also want to toss in a chunk of cream cheese, which is not really involved in the classic buffalo chicken wing. But we need a little bit here to kind of bind our filling. And then we're also going to add a nice generous splash of Louisiana hot sauce. Or the hot sauce from some other state. Whatever you're into. And then we'll finish this by seasoning it up with some kosher salt. As well as some freshly ground black pepper. And because it's in season, a little shake of cayenne. And that is it. We'll simply take a spoon and give this a mix. And we will keep mixing until we're sure everything's been incorporated evenly. And we're most concerned about the blue cheese. Okay, we really do want that evenly distributed. So give yourself a couple minutes until we've smeared everything together and it looks a little something like this. And once that's set, we are ready to move on to start filling our egg rolls. And to do that, of course, you're going to need some square egg roll wrappers, which are also sometimes sold as wonton wrappers. But same thing. And one tip here, as we're working with those, we want to keep a damp towel over the top, or either paper or cloth. And then the only other thing we're going to need is a little bit of an egg wash, which is simply an egg beaten with a tablespoon of water. And what we need to do before we start filling is go ahead and brush some of that egg wash around all the edges. And you can get some in the middle, like you're seeing me do here. But we definitely want to make sure at least we get the edges. And then once that's happened, we'll go ahead and spoon on about one ounce of our filling which is basically two tablespoons, also known as a heaping tablespoon. And we'll go ahead and transfer that on and kind of spread it out with our fingers. And then we'll go ahead and roll that bottom up over. But then we're going to stop and crimp in both edges and sort of even it out a little bit before we give it one more roll. And not only are we going to make sure both ends are pressed down and sealed, but we also want to fold over about a quarter of an inch of that dough on either side. And trust me when I tell you it's way easier than I'm making it look here. All right, I kept looking in the viewfinder afraid I was blocking the shot, which I really wasn't. But I blame that anxiety for the lack of smooth, graceful movements. But anyway, one way or another, we're going to seal those ends and fold over a little bit of dough. And once that's been accomplished, we'll apply a little more egg wash, because that little bit of dough we just folded over from the bottom does not have any. So we will apply a little bit more. And then we'll simply finish this up by rolling it all the way to the edge. And because we built up a little bit of extra dough along those two edges, not only is none of our filling going to leak out those ends, but we're not going to get a bunch of oil soaking in. And once done, we should have a nice neat package that looks a little something like this. And what we'll want to do as we finish these is transfer them onto a plastic lined tray or pan. 
And if I had portioned my filling on all of them, exactly the same as I did on the first one, I would have gotten exactly 16, which is why I got exactly 14. So apparently I used a little more for the rest of them. But that's fine, let's just say the recipe makes between 14 and 16. But anyway, once those are done, we can go ahead and wrap those up until we're ready to fry. Or if we want, we could freeze those for a future date. Or of course, we could just go ahead and start frying right away. Which is what I'm going to do right now in some hot oil set over medium heat. And while of course these are much easier to do in a deep fryer, they still really work out quite well pan fried like this. Alright, as long as our oil comes up at least halfway, we should be good. And what we'll do is give those a couple minutes on each side. Although it looks like this side could have used a little more time. Except that one's good. Must be a hot spot. And to counter that, we can always just reposition these. And basically because our filling is already cooked, all we're doing here is getting the outside as brown and crispy as possible before the stuff inside tries to escape. Which eventually it will if you keep them in here too long. But basically I like to let these fry as long as I can before they get too dark or they start exploding. And right about here I decided they had gone long enough. And I transfer those onto a plate with a paper towel underneath so they could drain just a little bit. And sure they look gorgeous and appeared crispy. But of course as tradition dictates, I grabbed a fork to make sure. Oh yeah. And after hearing that sound, I knew they were officially ready to plate up, which I'm doing next to a little bit of pure Louisiana hot sauce. And I finished up with a little bit of celery leaf, since what the heck else are we gonna do with that stuff? And that's it, my mini buffalo chicken egg rolls were done. And while that plain Louisiana hot sauce might seem like kind of a boring accompaniment, it really was absolutely perfect. Okay, classic buffalo style chicken wing sauce is nothing more than hot sauce with melted butter or margarine. But because of the creamy buttery goodness provided by the cream cheese and the blue cheese, I didn't think I needed any in the dip, and I was right. But of course, having said that, you go ahead and serve these any way you want. I mean, you are after all the flippin' boss of your dippin' sauce. But for me, the plain hot sauce worked absolutely perfectly. And I'm not picky. I'll pretty much eat any filling stuffed in a crispy egg roll. But the combination of that tender chicken and creamy cheeses, which was perfectly balanced by that little bit of texture and bitterness from the celery, I thought made for just a magnificent filling. So basically to summarize, this is everything you love about buffalo style chicken wings, without the bones, and without having to eat the celery and blue cheese separately. Plus it all comes packaged in a beautiful crispy tube like delivery system. And who among us does not love things delivered in tubes? So I really did thoroughly enjoy these, and I proved it by eating like nine of them. And I'm imagining you will also probably do the same thing. But there's only one way to find out for sure, which is why I really do hope you give these a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Buffalo chicken nuggets. That's right, I've always wanted to show you my method for making chicken nuggets. And with the Super Bowl, oops, sorry, I mean the big game right around the corner, I thought this buffalo flavored version would be just what the doctor ordered. Well, actually the doctor ordered kale chips, but you know what I mean. Anyway, I am very excited to show you this since we are actually gonna make a real nugget, which is certainly not the same thing as just deep frying a little piece of chicken. Okay, as we say in the business, a nugget must be fabricated. So with that, let's go ahead and get started by adding some boneless, skinless chicken thigh to a food processor. And yes, it is true that chicken breast is almost always used here, but the meat from a chicken thigh tastes almost identical to a chicken wing. And since that's what we're going for here, that's what I'm gonna use. And then to that, we're gonna add a little bit of filler in the form of some dry breadcrumbs. We will, of course, also need some salt, as well as some freshly ground black pepper. And then after the pepper, I'm gonna sneak in a little bit of Old Bay, which is a seasoning blend. And if you're not familiar with it, as usual, I will explain that on the blog post. I think we should also toss in a little bit of paprika, as well as some of that fan favorite cayenne pepper. Okay, so that's going to be it for our dry seasoning. So now we're going to do a little wet seasoning. We are going to drizzle in one tablespoon of hot sauce, preferably Frank's. It's not the best hot sauce, but it is traditional. And then we'll finish up with the second ingredient that makes wing sauce wing sauce, some melted butter. Although, fun fact, the original buffalo wing was done with margarine. I know, the horror. So we'll do a little bit of melted butter, at which point we're going to want to process this by pulsing on and off until we've achieved basically a coarse chicken paste. So you know the drill. Just pulse it on and off, on and off. And right here you can get a really great look at my pulsing finger form, 
Okay, you want to maintain like an 18 to 20 degree angle on that first knuckle for maximum control. But anyway, like I said, we're going to process that until we have a coarse paste. And exactly how coarse, of course, is up to you. You are, after all, the D's nuts of D's nuggets. But let me take this top off and pull the blade out so you can see how far I went. So I'm not really trying to get something that's super smooth, but I really don't want a lot of big chunks in it either. So that is looking pretty good. And then what we'll do once our nugget base has been aced is portion it up. And as you may know, my favorite tool for something like this would be the sorbet scoop. And if you're thinking, what happens if some of those portions aren't perfectly equal? Well, nothing actually, unless they were really far off. And then they may not cook at the same rate. But anyway, I went ahead and scooped up 24 portions. And note to self, next time start first row closer to the edge. Since I know placing that one scoop there really, really bothered many of you. You know who you are. And then what we'll want to do once that's portioned is cover that with a little bit of plastic and then chill it thoroughly since it'll be easier to work with. Which you can do in the fridge if you want. But to expedite things, I just like to pop mine in the freezer for about 15 minutes. And what we can do while we're waiting is go ahead and mix up our starch mixture, which I almost called a breading, but it's not. All we're going to coat our nuggets with is some cornstarch, into which we're going to mix some self-rising flour, which is nothing more than regular flour with baking powder and salt in it. And then speaking of salt, we'll add a little extra pinch. And as you probably noticed, we'll just add everything to a plastic bag, which will make mixing this and coating our nuggets relatively mess-free. But anyway, we'll make sure that's mixed thoroughly. And that is now ready to coat our hopefully somewhat slightly firmer chicken mixture. And no, we don't want them frozen solid. That's not going to work. Okay, we just want them to firm up a little bit, but still be pliable. So that is perfect right there. And we can go ahead and start tossing those into our flour mixture three or four at a time. And I guess you could shape these as you go. But for whatever reason, I generally like to coat them first and then go around forming them into the shape of my choice. And personally, I'm going to be going with your classic nugget shape sort of oval, and flattened out to about 5 eighths of an inch. And as long as you do sort of flatten them out to a similar thickness, you can pretty much make any shape you want. So if you want to do circles or squares or trapezoids, feel free, whatever you're into. And then once our nuggets have been starched and shaped, I would love to tell you they're ready to fry. But they're not. I mean, you could, but they're not going to look that good. Right? What we really want to do is pop these in the fridge overnight so that that starch on the surface hydrates, and we lose that powdery white appearance. Of course, having said that, that's not what I did. All right, the sun was going down and I wanted to finish the video. So I decided to fry these just after a couple hours. And while it looks like most of the starch is hydrated, you can sort of see it still looks a little bit powdery. But anyway, we'll revisit that issue later. For now, let's just go ahead and fry these up. And we are recommending our famous twice fried method. And what that involves is frying these for exactly one minute at 300 degrees, chilling them, and then frying them a second time at 375 so that they get beautifully golden brown and crispy. Okay, you may remember this technique from such videos as French fries and Korean fried chicken. So like I said, we'll just do one minute at 300, at which point we will chill those in the fridge until we're ready for the second frying. And by the way, if you're making a whole bunch of these for future use, it's after this first frying that you would store them in the freezer, and that way you can just pull them out and pop them in the hot oil when you're ready to serve. Which, by the way, is exactly what they've done to the nuggets you buy at the store. But anyway, to recap, we cooked those for a minute at 300 and then chilled them, at which point they are now ready to finish for just two minutes at 375. Assuming, of course, yours have been flattened out to a similar size. All right, if they're bigger, it's going to take longer. And I should mention, just in case two-step frying procedures aren't your thing, you can certainly just fry these once at 375 for about three and a half minutes, but they won't be quite as gorgeous or crispy. But anyway, I am using the two-step method, and this is what mine looked like after the second frying at 375 for two minutes, and not only do I think those look beautiful, but you have to admit those do look extremely nugget-like. And who said they don't look that crispy? The microphone was far away, but trust me, they were crispy. And then of course, once your nuggets have been successfully fried, we will serve those up with possibly some celery sticks, as well as some blue cheese dressing, which I've spiked with some hot sauce. And yes, you can toss these nuggets in buffalo wing sauce before you serve them, but I prefer to dip. And by combining the hot sauce and the blue cheese, we're doing half the work to get both sauces in one bite. But forget about the dip for a second. It was fine. But these nuggets really were amazing. Right, in addition to that thin crispy coating, we have a tender, flavorful, and very juicy interior. And as I mentioned earlier, because we used chicken thigh, the actual taste of the meat is way closer to a chicken wing than if we had used breast. And by the way, if you're using breast instead of thighs because of the fat, you gotta read some books. Fat's okay now.
Yes, upon further review, fat's good, sugar bad. But anyway, I was just absolutely thrilled with how these came out, except for one minor thing. Remember when I said we should leave these overnight? So the starch has time to hydrate? Okay, if we look very closely at this last one, you see those kind of lighter, drier patches? Okay, that's what happens if you cook these too soon and that starch has not hydrated. So before we sign off, let me show you some additional footage I shot the next day. Right, they should have this sort of pink look to them and not still be white and powdery. And if you do have the patience and or time management skills to do these the night before, this is what they're actually supposed to look like after you fry them. Okay, not a huge difference, but definitely a little bit of a richer, deeper color, as well as none of those unsightly powdery spots. But anyway, that's it, how to make your own chicken nuggets. We did sort of a buffalo style wing approach here, but this really is more of a techniques video and you can season these any way you want. So whether you're gonna make them for the big game or not, I really do hope you give these a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Million Dollar Dip. That's right, do not let the name fool you. This stuff is way more affordable than it sounds. And it's only called this because people think it tastes like a million dollars. And usually when people say that, it's mostly hyperbole. But this time I think it's very accurate and appropriate. Since if I had to choose just one word to describe this, it would be rich. So with that, let's go ahead and get started on what I consider this recipe's secret ingredient, a big handful of slivered almonds, which we're gonna very lightly toast in a dry pan set over medium heat. And while these are technically cooked because they're blanched, I think by toasting them a little bit in this pan before we add them to the dip, they're gonna become a little more savory and pair even better with our cheese. And of course, if you wanna mix these around with a the utensil, feel free. But as usual, I prefer to show off and toss them in the pan. And in case you're interested, we have an entire video dedicated to this technique, which involved a lot of cheese balls. But anyway, we will toss those over medium heat for a few minutes until they just start to smell like toasted almonds. And maybe they start to get a little touch of golden color, but not really too much. And then once that happens, we'll go ahead and transfer those onto a plate where we will let them cool completely before we add them to the dip. And generally, when you're toasting nuts like this, you always want to add in one to two extra tablespoons. Since recent made up studies show that's the average amount people will eat as this cools. So something to keep in mind. And then once that's set, we can move on to the only other thing we're gonna cook, which would be six strips of bacon. That as usual, we will start in a cold pan over medium heat. And we really do wanna take our time here and cook this crisp. All right, flabby bacon is not something you want in a dip. And to help you do this properly, I want you to remember the following famous food wishes rhyme. When it starts to get foamy, your bacon's almost done, homie. Okay, you see that white foam? That means almost all the fat is rendered out. And once cooled, your bacon is gonna be beautifully crisp. So whenever I see that, it tells me this stuff's ready to pull out of the pan. And we'll go ahead and transfer that onto a paper towel lined plate, where we will let it cool completely before chopping it up. And obviously, you can go ahead and chop this up as small as you want, but I'm not trying to make bacon dust. All right, I'm going for more like bacon bits. So I'm gonna stop when it looks a little something like this, as the size of those pieces are looking pretty good to me, except that one piece, that's a little too big. And that's it, once our bacon's chopped, we can move on to the rest of our dip ingredients, which will include some mayonnaise. And then to that, we will add a half a pound of sharp cheddar. And of course, we've grated that ourselves because we're not crazy. And I'm actually using half orange and half white sharp cheddar here for no other reason than I like the color it provides. And in case you didn't know, it's literally the same cheese, except that the orange is colored with a little bit of a natto seed, which doesn't alter the flavor. And then at this point, we can go ahead and toss in our bacon, as well as a whole bunch of thinly sliced green onions. And do yourself a favor, use a sharp knife for those. The flavor will be better, and I'm not kidding. And then we'll also go ahead and give it a few shakes of cayenne. And that's it, we'll go ahead and spatulate that until well mixed. And while I'm stirring this, let me give you a great tip. When you dump your toasted almonds on that plate to cool, don't do that on a countertop on the other side of the kitchen. Otherwise, you might not notice it and forget to put it in. Which, of course, I definitely didn't do here. I'm just simulating that to make a point. So I'll go ahead and stop and add those now. And continue mixing. And that's it. Once everything's been thoroughly combined, it is technically ready to serve, but I wouldn't. Okay, I highly recommend we wrap this up and chill in the fridge before we serve it. And of course, exactly how long will be up to you. I mean, you are after all the 1% of how much chilling time is spent. 
but for me, I think it should chill for at least an hour. And longer is probably even better. And yes, overnight is fine. So you can make this the day before the party, no problem. But anyway, I let mine chill for a few hours before transferring that into a serving bowl, which is hopefully sitting next to a very specific type of cracker. You know, like the ones they serve at the fancy hotels, like the Ritz. And normally I would say taste this for seasoning, but you don't need to. All right, don't even waste your time. It's going to be perfect. But what we will do once that's transferred in is garnish the top with a scattering of green onions, as well as a little more crispy bacon. And that's it. Our million dollar dip is million dollar done. And speaking of dip, before we get into the taste, we have to make sure this actually qualifies as a dip, meaning it has to be soft enough so we can scoop some up with a cracker without it breaking, which this was, but just barely. So it's probably not a bad idea to have some kind of knife or spreader near this so that your guests can use that, because it is easier. And by the end of the party, you will have significantly less crumbs in this. But anyway, enough about the texture. Let's move on to the taste, which really is beyond incredible. I mean, just a plain old cheese dipper spread is amazing. But when you combine that smoky bacon and the green onions, plus the extra richness those almonds provide, this really is one of the most delicious and surprisingly decadent spreads or dips you will ever have. Which is why the name fits so perfectly. I mean, this truly is, in every sense of the word, rich. Oh, and if you're thinking, that looks a lot like Neiman Marcus dip. Well, it is. It's the exact same recipe which apparently at some point was rebranded. But no matter what you call it, if you're ready to have your taste buds taken up to the next tax bracket, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Sloppy Dip. That's right, this is called Sloppy Dip because it's inspired by the Sloppy Joe and not because it's perfect to serve to people that are sloppy drunk. Although, having said that, this is perfect for that demographic. But anyway, as always, we want to remind you to drink responsibly, especially if you're going to be attending one of these upcoming Super Bowl parties, which, by the way, this amazing hot dip would be perfect for. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with this incredibly simple recipe. In fact, it's so simple that to start, we're just going to dump all our non-liquid ingredients into this pot. And first up, we're going to need a couple pounds of relatively lean ground beef, to which we will add some diced onion, as well as some diced green bell pepper. And then we will finish up adding our vegetation with a generous addition of minced garlic, at which point we can move on to our seasonings. So let's go ahead and toss in a little bit of brown sugar, which of course is hopefully gonna balance out our spicy and salty elements. And then we will also add some freshly ground black pepper, as well as a very generous shake of cayenne. And as usual, the exact amount is up to you. You are after all the Matt Ryan of how much cayenne, and then we are definitely going to need some kosher salt, as well as a few tablespoons of all-purpose flour, which is going to help add a little bit of body to our dip. All right, we want this to be sloppy, but not necessarily messy. And that's going to be it for our non-fluid ingredients. And yes, we really do want to add all this to a cold pot, because what we're going to do next is move to the stove and place this over medium-high heat. And what we're going to do is break up and stir that meat while it comes up to temperature. And by starting in a cold pot, I think it's a lot easier to get nice small pieces. And I say small pieces, but what we're really going for is more of a paste. And not a whole heck of a lot's gonna happen at the beginning, but as our mixture heats through, that salt's gonna draw liquid out of the onions and the peppers and help us in the process of creating that meat paste we're going for, made up of millions, maybe billions of tiny pieces of meat. And fair warning, I'm editing this quite a bit. This is probably gonna take you at least 15 minutes, maybe more. And by the way, any kind of spatula or wooden spoon will work here, but this flat-edged wooden spatula really does a great job. And you might be thinking, oh great, I don't have one of those. Maybe not. But if you do have one too many wooden spoons and a saw, you could have one. But anyway, we will continue to work that over on medium high until most of that moisture has evaporated and our mixture sort of dried out and browned up and resembles something like this. And then what we'll do as soon as we've determined our mixture is cooked long enough is add the rest of the ingredients. So first up, we'll go ahead and dump in a whole bunch of ketchup. Or as the waiter in the hotel I stayed in Italy called it, American sauce, which I found annoying and funny at the same time. And then we'll also toss in a nice big spoon of mustard. I'm using Dijon. And then we will also do a very carefully measured spoon of Worcestershire sauce. I don't know why people have trouble pronouncing that. It's quite easy. And then we will go ahead and finish this off with a couple cups of chicken broth. Or water if you want. 
And then we'll go ahead and give that a stir. And then what's going to happen once those newly introduced ingredients heat through is it's going to start to simmer, at which point we will set our heat to about medium and proceed to cook this stirring for approximately 45 minutes or so, or until our dip reaches our desired thickness, as determined by you and only you. And one reason I like to add a good amount of liquid and cook it for a long time is so all those little tiny pieces of meat get really, really super tender, which sounds kind of funny because they're so small, but I really think you can notice a difference with one that's cooked a long time like mine than one that maybe had less liquid added and only simmered for like 15 or 20 minutes. So I simply let mine cook on medium for approximately 45 minutes or so until I was absolutely thrilled with how my mixture looked. And then once we've determined this is cooked to our ideal viscosity, it is pretty much ready to serve. Although as is customary, we will taste a little bit mostly for salt. And since I'm gonna serve this on sliced baguette, that's what I'm gonna test it on. That just makes sense. So I gave mine a little taste, which was amazing. And once we're happy with the seasoning, we can move on to final assembly, which I should mention we're only gonna do if we're gonna present this as a baked dip, which I am. Okay, if you want, you could just keep that pot on low on the stove and not do anything and use it as a dip as is. But it's been my experience that people drinking at parties seem to really enjoy things finished with melted cheese. So I'm gonna go ahead and transfer my mixture into this saucepan. And then once that's set, we will apply half our shredded cheese and then take a fork and give it the old polka polka. And in case you're wondering, I went with a sharp cheddar. So we'll go ahead and kind of stir and poke that in. At which point we will top with the other half of the cheese that we will not be poking in. And that's it. Once the second half of our cheese is scattered over, we are ready to finish that in a very hot oven. Or as I did it, under a hot broiler for about five minutes or so until our top is hot and bubbling and looks something like this. And by the way, that's not grease on the surface. That is beautiful caramelized cheese and some grease. But hey, anybody can make a baked dip that is unhealthy. I think it should also look unhealthy. And sure, I guess if you want to blot the top of the paper towel, go ahead. But since I use grass-fed beef, as you should, throwing away that omega-rich fat would be like throwing away medicine. But anyway, enough about how it looks. Let's place that next to some sliced bread and go in for a taste. And while I do enjoy the Sloppy Joe as much as any other red-blooded American, I think I like this sloppy dip even better, which could be the cheese. But no matter what it is, I just can't think of a better hot dip to serve at a party, sports-related or otherwise. And trust me, that relatively long cooking time really pays off here. Okay, not only is this stuff super flavorful, but because we did cook it for a relatively long time, that meat is very soft and tender, which I think is the key here. Oh, and by the way, to qualify as a world-class hot dip, it must be equally delicious at all temperatures. Okay, piping hot, warm, or room temp, this stuff is still amazing. In fact, believe it or not, this is even pretty good cold, as I discovered recently after returning from a trip to Mendocino. But anyway, that's it, sloppy dip. Maybe consider taking a little bit of a break from the usual chili recipe this year, since I think this would make a nice change of pace, yet it's actually pretty similar. So I really do hope you give this a try soon. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Boil and bake baby back ribs. That's right, this is going to upset some people who think it's just insanity to boil ribs. And to those people I say, you're probably right. But anyway, we'll explain all that in the blog post. But for now, I'm just going to show you my version, which was for a hot five spice flavored baby back rib. So step one here, we need some flavorful liquid to boil our ribs in. I'm going to go with some cold water, garlic, onion, bay leaves, lots of red pepper flakes, a good amount of salt, and some Chinese five spice powder. All right, we're going to put that on high heat and bring that up to temperature. I'm also going to add a big giant splash of rice wine vinegar. So this is almost sort of like a hot brine type thing. So bring this entire mixture up to a simmer over high heat. When it looks like that, I want you to back the heat down so it's just simmering. Okay, so while our five spice broth is simmering, I'm gonna go ahead and prep one slab of baby back ribs, which we have right here. By the way, I'm sure this will work with spare ribs too, but I'm using the baby back. All right, we're gonna flip it over and talk about this side for a second because some people are insane with the membrane. There's like a thin membrane that runs on top of that bone side. And some people have you peel that off. I don't. I just take my knife and run it along the back there, sort of slicing up that membrane, which I believe pretty much does nothing, but it makes me feel better. All right, after that, we're going to slice up this rack into individual ribs. It's really easy to feel 
where the bone and flesh is. So it's very simple to go between the bones. The problem is, is when you get to the front, the side facing you right now, there's like a strip of bone that's kind of tough to get through sometimes. And what ends up happening is I get impatient and I just pound it and it goes right through, which is fine. That technique will work. The problem is you're risking little bone fragments. So if you can, take your time and try to find the spaces between those bones so you're really not having to cut through bone if you can avoid it. If you can't, no problem. Get through it any way you can. But bottom line, you want to separate all those ribs. And from one slab of baby back ribs, you're going to get about 12 or 13 pieces. All right, once our ribs are sectioned, we're going to go ahead and drop them into our simmering hot and spicy five spice broth. And as soon as that comes back to a simmer, which is just going to take a few minutes, I want you to adjust the flame so you're in a nice gentle simmer and set your timer for one hour. So we're going to simmer these ribs for one hour. And yes, this is false advertising. It's not really boiled and baked. It's actually simmered and baked. It just doesn't have the same alliterational excitement that boil and bake has. All right, while those are simmering for an hour, I'm going to go ahead and prep our glaze. This could be any sauce, literally. So my glaze is going to consist of soy sauce, rice vinegar, sambal chili paste, Dijon mustard, some ketchup, some honey, and brown sugar. And then another hit of that five spice powder. All right, I'm going to whisk that up and my glaze is pretty much ready. All right. And like I said, you can use any glaze for this. So whatever your favorite sauce recipe is, you could just substitute it here. Of course, altering the flavors in your braising liquid accordingly. All right. One hour later, our ribs are going to look like this. They're definitely not going to be falling off the bone. All right. They're not necessarily going to be fork tender either. They're just going to be ready for the next step, which is you pulling them out and throwing them into your bowl of sauce. You're going to want to toss those ribs I suggest the venerable spoonula for this operation. Of course, if you want to make a big mess, flip them like this, and they will splash all over. By the way, you're going to have some extra sauce at the bottom of the mixing bowl. Do not throw it away. We're going to use that to glaze the ribs halfway through. All right, once those are coated, I'm going to go ahead and transfer those onto my baking sheet that I lined with a Silpat. Those are going to go in a 375 degree oven for 15 minutes, but that's only half the cooking time. And after 15 minutes, they really don't look like they're doing much, but don't worry. Pull them out. You're going to flip them and you're going to paint on a little extra sauce. Put them back in for 15 more minutes and then we got something. Okay. So this has been a half hour. They're looking pretty beautiful. You could serve them like this. But you know what? I had a little more glaze in my bowl. So I painted them one more time. When it comes to glaze, I'm greedy. It's actually called glaze greed. I have that. All right. So I painted some more on. I put them back in for just three or four more minutes. And then I piled them up and served them. And they were fantastic. I know many of you don't believe me because you're thinking there's no way you could boil ribs, bake them and have them come out decent. Well, before you call me an idiot, you should probably try it first. And for a shortcut method, I think these really do have a great texture. It is moist, it is tender, but it's not just falling right off the bone. You actually have to put your teeth into it and it feels good. That aromatic five spice is just under the surface. Really great background flavor. The heat from the chili flakes and the sambal. Sweet and sour tang of the glaze. Just a great bite of rib. Like I said, I don't expect anyone to believe this method works unless they actually try it. Which reminds me, I hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more information as usual. And as always, enjoy. Steakage, the ultimate steak sandwich. And why is it called steakage? Because we are taking a piece of steak, but treating it more like a piece of sausage on the grill to make a better sandwich. We're also gonna show you a very cool, warm mushroom salad to garnish your steakage. But first, let's prep our meat. So I'm gonna need you to go talk to a real butcher, one that knows what they're doing, because you need a fully trimmed flat iron steak. And this works so perfectly the width is just about the same as a hot dog bun, which is how we're going to serve this. So the idea here is basically cut thick strips of steak that fit on a hot dog bun instead of thin slices of steak that go on those big, thick sandwich rolls. So this is going to be a much better proportion and hopefully a much better steak sandwich eating experience. All right, this will work with other cuts as I will outline on the blog post, but try to get a flat iron steak. It's just so perfect for this. And by the way, if my meat is looking extra, extra sexy, it's because it's American Kobe, which is normally well marbled, but this is just over the top gorgeous. 
All right, so after my steakage is cut, I'm gonna season it generously with salt and black pepper, and that is ready for the grill. So I'm just gonna set that aside and move on to our grilled mushroom salad. All right, so I have one package of brown clamshell mushrooms. I forget the real name. There's a Japanese name for these. But anyway, you find these at the nicer grocery stores, very common these days. And this is how they came, right out of the package. They're still attached at the bottom. So I'm gonna leave them in kind of large pieces. And I'm gonna grill those for about five or six minutes, just until they start to wilt. All right, and get some nice grill marks, a little bit of caramelization. It's really gonna bring out that meaty flavor in the mushroom. All right, it's gonna get nice and smoky. And once those mushrooms are grilled to my satisfaction, I'm gonna bring those inside throw them on a cutting board, and before I dress them, I'm just gonna take a knife and cut off the bottom where all those stems meet. See that? Now you could chop that and use it, I just discarded it, I'm not sure why. All right, so once all the mushrooms are separated, I'm gonna toss those in a bowl with some salt and pepper, some sherry vinegar, and some extra virgin olive oil, and that's it. So this is really super basic and simple, but it's really gonna make a great garnish for our steakage sandwich. All right, so that's ready. I'm gonna set that aside. All right, we're gonna head out back to the grill, which is still nice and hot, and we're gonna grill our pieces of steakage. So again, you can see the key here is you want something that's as wide as it is thick. I think the fatal flaw of most steak sandwiches is too much bread and not enough meat because the steak is usually cut from like a New York strip and it's too thin and wide. Here, like a piece of sausage, we're working with a much thicker, more uniform shaped piece of meat. So not only is the shape superior because it lets us serve it on a hot dog roll where the star is really gonna be the meat, not the bread, but it also allows for a juicier, easier to cook piece of meat. So after three or four minutes per side, mine were pretty much perfect medium rare. I pulled them off. Even though they're small pieces, I still let it rest for a couple minutes. While I dressed my bun, which I suggest you do as follows. Nice soft hot dog bun, you could toast it. Lots of mayonnaise. You're gonna need a little bit of bitter green, some arugula maybe, not too much. Some quartered cherry tomatoes. All right, when it's not summer, that's always your best and sweetest option. All right, then we're gonna put a nice big spoon of our warm grilled mushroom salad. And to finish off, a very simple barbecue vinaigrette. And I'm gonna have that recipe on the blog. It's just a little bit of barbecue sauce thinned out with some oil and vinegar. Makes a great dressing to this steak sandwich. And there you go, what I'm calling the steakage, the ultimate steak sandwich. And to be all authentic, I filmed this outside and it was really overcast and the light was not good. But anyway, you can still see it was beautifully pink, juicy, and just I think a really great alternative way to present a steak sandwich off the grill. Anyway, I hope you give that a try. Hot dogs and hamburgers are fine for the regular season, but when it gets close to the playoffs and the Super Bowl, you want something a little more special. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts, as usual. And as always, enjoy. Fried mozzarella puffs. That's right, people love bumpy food, especially when it's also crispy and produced by frying cheese, which is exactly what we have here as I'm attempting to update and sophisticate the good old fashioned fried mozzarella stick. And not only are these tastier, more interesting, and more fun to eat, they're also much easier and don't require any breading. So with that, let's go ahead and get started by making a very, very simple pastry dough, which we'll start by adding a little bit of butter to this pan, along with some cold, fresh water, and what looks like a lot of salt. But it's not, since we're going to be working with mozzarella, which tends to be a little bit bland. And what we're going to do here is set our heat to medium-high, and as soon as the water starts to simmer, and that butter melts or almost melts. We'll go ahead and dump in our flour all at once, reduce our heat to medium, and stir that in with a small spatula or wooden spoon, freakishly small or otherwise. And it's not gonna look like things are going well when you first start, but don't worry, just keep mixing and stirring and smearing. And eventually all the flour and lumps are gonna disappear, and it will all eventually pull together and smooth out. At which point all we have to do is cook it stirring for about two or three minutes. And as we do this, that dough is going to kind of want to stick to the bottom. But because of the moisture in the dough, as we kind of stir and scrape, it's also going to not want to stick to the bottom. Okay, so basically the dough doesn't know what it wants to do. But anyway, like I said, we will cook that for two or three minutes, scraping and rubbing that pan as clean as we can. 
And then what we'll do once that's been accomplished is quickly remove that from the heat and transfer it into a mixing bowl where we will let it cool for about five to 10 minutes. And to help that process, it's always a good idea to kind of spread it out. And really all we're waiting for is for this mixture to go from very, very hot to just very warm, which if I had to guess is gonna take between five and 10 minutes. And then what we'll do once this is cooled a bit is season it up with some freshly ground black pepper along with the obligatory shake of cayenne. And then we will add one large egg from a distance of about three feet so that the yolk breaks when it hits. And by the way, that last instruction actually serves no practical purpose. It's just something fun to do. And then to finish this, what we'll do is take a whisk and mix this until it all comes together to form a very soft, very, very sticky dough. And fair warning, when you first start doing this, it's gonna look like something went tragically and horribly wrong. But don't worry, just keep mixing. And eventually it will all come together, literally come all together, as in it will all come together stuck inside your whisk. And that's how you're gonna know it's done. And then once that happens, we'll take a spatula and clean off our whisk into the bowl, which is by far the hardest part of this whole recipe. And it is a lot faster if you kind of bang the whisk on the bowl, but then you'll probably have little pieces of dough stuck to your wall and ceiling. So I'm just gonna go with the spatula. So we will clean off our whisk, and then give that one last mix with the spatula to make sure everything's beautifully smooth. And then what's gonna happen next, once we have that all together in one lump and we've scraped down the sides of our bowl the best we can, is we're gonna cover this in plastic and refrigerate it for about an hour before we add our cheese, which is why we'll wrap it with the spatula. And while that's chilling, we can go ahead and make our marinara sauce dip, which is simply gonna be some prepared marinara sauce that we will accessorize with the following ingredients. Some dry oregano, some red pepper flakes, if you want it spicy, which we do. We will also do a little splash of balsamic vinegar. And then last but not least, one anchovy filet, or as we call it around the office, Italian MSG. And then what we'll do is go ahead and give this a stir, and we will bring this up to a simmer on medium heat. And that is pretty much gonna be it. Other than giving it a stir or two, we'll just let that simmer for about 10 minutes, and then we can turn it off and just keep it in a warm spot until we're ready to use it. And it is kind of nice if the sauce is served warm, but room temperature is totally fine. Okay, so our sauce is done. And then assuming our dough is chilled, we'll go ahead and pull that out. And we will finish this off by grating in a relatively large amount of low moisture mozzarella cheese, also known as not the good mozzarella cheese. Okay, for this recipe to work, we really have to use the firmer, drier stuff which means that beautiful, fresh, creamy mozzarella is not gonna work here. And by not work, I mean explode in the oil. So this time we're gonna let you buy the cheap stuff. And for heaven's sake, grate it yourself. Okay, cellulose dust is not on the ingredient list. So we'll go ahead and grate that in and give it a mix with the spatula. And what's kind of funny here is we're adding so much cheese, this recipe actually shouldn't work, but somehow it does. And then once we're sure that's been mixed in and distributed evenly, We'll scrape our spatula down with a spoon and then grab a second spoon, since that's how I like to get this dough into the oil. Okay, so we'll take some with one spoon and then if we want, we can kind of shape it with the other into sort of an oval shape, which by the way is completely optional. Since it's been my experience, no matter how carefully you shape these, they all kind of look the same once they're fried, which I will prove later. And then what we'll do once we have the amount and shape we want is carefully transfer that into some 350 degree oil which by the way, mine wasn't. I was impatient and it probably was just over 300. And the problem with that, especially if you're trying to get away with just a couple inches of oil, is that it can and will stick to the bottom. Although it usually will release easily with a little nudge. But anyway, what we'll do is fry that for about two or three minutes or until browned and crispy. And for this test, I'm just doing one. But you can easily do four or five or six at a time. And other than going by the appearance, one way you can tell these are done is that you'll see little tiny pieces of mozzarella poking up through the surface, which I was trying to show you by flipping this over, but it wasn't working. Okay, you're gonna kind of see it here as I lift it out. And that's it, we'll just drain that for a minute on a napkin or paper towel, at which point it's ready to enjoy. And if these are still hot or even warm, when you break it in half and pull it apart, you're gonna get that super sexy string cheese effect, which everybody loves, especially the kids. And crispy texture and stretchy visuals aside, these things taste like a beautifully creamy hunk of warm, melty mozzarella cheese. So other than the oil temp, that was my very successful test. 
and I proceeded to fry four more, intentionally not spending any time shaping them. Okay, I'm pretty much just scooping some of the dough and pushing it off with the other spoon. And other than making sure your oil's at the right temp, the other thing to be careful of is not to drop these on top of each other. Okay, after a few seconds, that surface will seal, and you'll be fine. But when you drop another one in, make sure there's not one right under it. And like I said earlier, we'll fry these for about two to three minutes. And of course, the exact time is going to depend on how much dough you spooned in. So you'll have to observe and adjust. I mean, you guys are after all the Jimmy G's of how long to fry your cheese. But about three minutes is a good guess. Or just fry them until they look a little something like this. And of course, as the one frying, any little random bits of rogue dough that fall into the oil, you are allowed to eat. Mmm, micro puff. And as you can hopefully see, even if you don't shape these, they still come out looking quite nice and very, very enticing. Although for comparison purposes, I did fry four more after these, taking the time to shape them as carefully as possible. And while they do maybe look a little more uniform, those four in the front do not look that much differently than those four in the back we fried before these. So the point is, do not stress trying to get these perfect going into the oil. And then because this is an Italian-American appetizer, we are required by law to garnish with a little bit of parsley. And that's it. These are now ready to officially enjoy, which I would have loved to do right away so the cheese was still stretchy. But I didn't. I took way too many pictures. So these cooled down, and I didn't get the sexy cheese stretch. But that's fine. Even at room temp, these are still amazing especially dipped in that extra flavorful, slightly spicy sauce. And even though my brain knew these weren't stretchy, my fingers did not get the message, so I kept trying to pull it apart to stretch it. But even though these weren't visually stretchy, the insides are still beautifully creamy, and they really do taste like you're eating a piece of crispy, fresh mozzarella cheese. Although somehow, unlike eating a chunk of fried mozzarella, thanks to our French pastry, these are actually very, very light in texture. Hence the name Puff. Oh, and I should mention, if you're doing a large amount, you can reserve the ones you fried in a warm oven, and they hold beautifully. So something to keep in mind. But anyway, that's it. What we're calling fried mozzarella puffs. If you like fried mozzarella sticks, but don't enjoy all that messy breading and associated gunked up fingers, you are absolutely going to love these. Which is why I really do hope you give them a try soon. So please follow the links below for all the ingredient amounts a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Kentucky Beer Cheese. That's right, and while I've never actually been to Kentucky, I have been to Beer and Cheese many, many times. And if you're a fan of the beer and cheese like I am, you're going to enjoy this unique and super easy to make cheese spread. So let me show you how to put this together. And the first thing you're going to need is one large, cheap domestic beer. And as you can see, I got the 24 ounce size, even though I only need one cup, which means that leaves 16 ounces for me. See kids, that's why I want you to pay attention to math in school. But anyway, we're going to pop the top. We're going to pour that in a bowl because we want flat beer. All right, we don't want any carbonation. Oh, and by the way, you're going to want to do this step ahead. And down in Kentucky, they would just leave an open beer overnight to get stale. But here we can expedite things by putting it in a bowl and giving it a little whisk. And that stuff will go stale very quickly. And eventually what you're looking for is this, no bubbles. And that beer has been properly prepped. And then once our beer's been flattened, it's time to grate our cheese. And right here I have one pound of extra sharp cheddar. I'm going with the orange variety as I think it looks more authentic. And we're going to go ahead and grate that right into the bowl of our food processor. And I do prefer grating to cubing, which a lot of these recipes call for. People just cut up the cheese in big chunks and blend it that way. But I really think the texture is better if you grate the cheese beforehand. So sure, it does take a couple extra minutes, but I didn't care. I was drinking the extra 16 ounces of beer. So that worked out nicely. And then after we've grated our cheese, we're going to go ahead and spice this up. All these ingredients, by the way, are mandatory. First up, we're going to need a couple cloves of crushed garlic. You want that crushed or minced very, very fine. We're also going to want some dry mustard, some freshly ground black pepper, a whole lot of cayenne pepper, a pinch of salt. We're also going to give it a few dashes of Louisiana hot sauce or Kentucky hot sauce if you have it. And then a few drops of Worcestershire sauce. And then last but not least, we're going to pour in about a cup of stale beer. And of course, you can vary the amounts of that depending on the texture you want here. 
And then once that's set, all we're going to do is process this until it's very smooth and creamy. And like most of these operations, we'll pulse to start. Just get it going. Once it looks like it's getting smooth, we'll stop. We'll scrape it down with a spatula. That's looking good. It's a good start, but we need to blend it much smoother. So we'll scrape that down, put the lid back on, and we'll simply continue until it's very, very smooth. And of course, this is edited for time, so it's going to take a couple minutes, a lot longer than it looks like here. But just keep blending until you have something that looks like this. And then, of course, because I've trained you properly, you're going to taste some, and you're going to adjust. Does it need more anything? All right, you might want to spice yours up a little more. You might want to put another pinch of salt or pepper up to you. You are the judge dread of your spread. Now, we are going to recommend that you refrigerate this overnight to let the flavors develop. But you can serve this right away. It's perfectly fine. And I just serve mine simply in a glass bowl with a little bit of extra cayenne. And of course, they just serve the celery and carrots down there for color. Nobody ever eats them. But you're going to want to put those on there anyway for appearances. But anyway, no matter how you serve this, you are in for a truly unique regional American snack. Oh, and by the way, it's worth noting that even though the texture might look grainy from a distance, it's actually very smooth and creamy. All right, so don't let that fool you. And as I bite this, I got to tell you, there's good news and bad news. The bad news is this is definitely an acquired taste. The good news is it only takes like three bites to acquire it. And I think the reason is if you've never had this before, that first bite really does taste kind of like sharp cheddar and skunky stale beer. But by the third, fourth, fifth bite, you are totally addicted and loving this delicious spread. Oh, and by the way, before I sign off here, I have to point out that wooden table you see me serving this on is actually made from reclaimed wood from the Zigzag Paper Factory in Kentucky. True story. But anyway, if you're looking for something a little unique for your Super Bowl party, or just want something a little more interesting the next time you entertain, I really hope you give this Kentucky beer cheese a try soon. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Enjoy.